think I want to give the word to uh, Christian Balog, who's going to present the first paper on conversational uh, AI from an IR perspective, which is a topic we are all interested in. Okay, Christian, you go. All right, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I must say that uh, it's a real pity that uh, you get to enjoy a in-person conference and the rest of us uh, have to sit at home and drink cold coffee. Uh, anyway, in this talk, I'd like to talk about um, some challenges and some possible solutions in this conversational space. And to start off, it's fair to ask what is it that I mean by conversational AI? Traditionally, there's a two-way distinction between task-oriented and non-task-oriented systems. Task-oriented systems usually focus on a closed domain. They follow some clearly designed structure and they try to help users complete some tasks. And these are typically these slot filling type of systems where uh, the system can help users, for example, book uh, accommodation or make travel arrangements. The other category is uh, non-task oriented or chit chat systems, where the goal is simply to keep the user engaged. Uh, there's no real structure there and uh, the agent tries to be as human-like as possible and, and uh, carry on a conversation about a broad set of topics. Now, more recently, this traditional categorization has been extended with the third category, which I call interactive question answering here, in recognition of the fact that uh, it doesn't really fit either of the other categories, but it deserves a, a separate uh, class on its own. And uh, uh, the next question uh, we might ask is, OK, within this distinction, where does uh, conversational information access fit. So when the user has some uh, information uh, need or help needs help with completing some task, where does it fit? And it would uh, fit in two categories or a mix of two categories, uh, task oriented and interactive uh, QA. Uh, so there is immediately this issue that we are cutting across multiple categories, even if uh, just focusing on information access related tasks. And I will come back to that issue uh, in a bit. But first, uh, since we are talking about uh, conversation and information access and search, you might ask, well, search uh, has always been a conversational experience between a search engine and the user. So imagine this uh, scenario where a user is interested in finding out where ECIR would take place next year. So issues this natural language query to their favorite search engine. And then there would be a search result page, which in this case would highlight a snippet with an answer that it would take place in Stavanger. Well done, Google. And obviously, this piece of information would get the user very excited, know a bit more about Stavanger. For example, if they were to attend the conference, what would be interesting places to visit before or after the conference? The user could ask uh, for places to visit in Stavanger, and the search engine would uh, respond with a rich result page featuring, among others, the famous pulpit truck. And if you happen to see the last uh, Mission Impossible movie, this is uh, the rock where Tom Cruise was uh, fighting for his life. And in that movie, that scene took place in India. And in fact, that rock is in Norway. So you are most welcome to come and see that with your own eyes if you happen to uh, visit uh, for ECIR 2022. But back to the conversation, the search engine result page offers many possible follow-up questions. Some are explicit in the people also ask box, but uh, others are results that are implicitly answering some questions or inviting the user to explore further. So I just had this conversation with the search engine. Uh, what I mean by conversational in what I would call the, the modern sense is something uh, uh, different, where it's really a, a dialogue, uh, the higher degree of personalization, where the conversational agent knows the, the user. It can provide support for complex 
a task that involved multiple steps and possibly uh, multiple sessions. Instead of just uh, uh, retrieving results, it would be able to generate and synthesize results for the user. It would work in settings where there's no keyboard or uh, screen. And it would be mixed initiative, so the agent would also suggest uh, uh, actions for the user. All right, so next question uh, that is uh, worth asking is, since we have this three-way categorization, uh, do humans really converse according to those clearly separable goals? And think about a, a, an imaginary conversation that feels uh, uh, quite natural. In my opinion, where the user would want to buy some running shoes and asks the conversation agent to something similar to uh, the previous uh, shoe brand, and then um, in this conversation, there uh, comes up an issue about anchor support, why it matters, and then uh, the user uh, at some point says that uh, they don't enjoy running that much lately. So there is this task, a clearly task-oriented component in the beginning, and then there is some interactive QA where the user tries to learn about some topic, and then there is the social chat part, and if you think about the last user utterance, there are possible multiple possible agent responses to that. One would be simply the agent saying, well, I'm sorry to hear that, but the agent could also respond by interpreting it as an implicit information need and suggest some motivational videos, for example. Okay, so uh, the point I'm trying to make here is uh, this is what we would need, a hybrid system, and most commercial systems do have this uh, uh, hybrid nature where there is a top level dialogue manager that tries to manage this on over a conversation process. And there are these uh, skills or, or uh, task specific uh, modes that generate uh, uh, responses in, in, according to the, the type of the, the dialogue. Uh, but this is uh, what I call the siloed view on the left-hand side. And uh, there is a desire for a holistic view, which was al already formulated uh, in 2018 in this full paper, where this uh, unified architecture would support multiple user goals. And uh, what I want to talk about is why is it difficult to, to get there and work on the holistic view. Uh, before that, we can very briefly just look at progress that has been made in this uh, uh, domain so far. And uh, it's uh, not an exhaustive list, but uh, the key themes, if you, if you look at it, intent detection, asking clarification questions, query resolution, response retrieval, those are all on the component level. And yes, many of these components shared across the different modes. So would, these would be valuable components, both in task-oriented and non-task-oriented and uh, uh, QA modes. But uh, uh, some could also say that uh, most of these would be just as valuable for traditional search. So they are not conversational in the modern sense of modern modern sense of the conversational uh, and what I was uh, referring to earlier. So. Takeaway point one is that it's perhaps time to consider this more holistic view of conversation information access. And this brings us to a challenge. And in this figure, you can see a system and the user and a conversation that can branch at each turn. And this is the, the, the space that the conversation can take. And currently, there are two ways of uh, evaluating this. One is turn-based uh, offline evaluation, where we focus on a single turn, a user utterance, and possible system responses given to that uh, user utterance. It's nice because it uh, allows us to create a reusable task collection for a specific task. 
but it is very limited and it doesn't tell us anything about uh, satisfaction with the agent overall. We can also look at uh, a specific conversation. So the, look at the transcript of the conversation, for example, and ask humans to annotate that or uh, online evaluation would also fall in this category. So we would have uh, an actual dialogue, but uh, it's not reusable. It's expensive to collect and to annotate. And uh, it's uh, again, just a single path in this whole space. Uh, I just want to quickly mention uh, the track uh, conversational assistance uh, uh, benchmark initiative as an example. Uh, and uh, here, uh, what you can see, it's an actual topic from track cast where uh, a, a sequence of user utterances is given. And each of these utterances, the system has to return a paragraph from a corpus. And the main challenge is to, according to this setup, is co-reference resolution. So in the second turn, what does it uh, refer to? And uh, uh, if you think about uh, this view on the right-hand side, then it's uh, very far from, from the one on the left. And uh, this is an extremely uh, difficult problem to build a reusable uh, test collection. But uh, we want to make sure that when we are abstracting tasks, then we don't abstract away the aspects that we are most interested in. And in this case, this would be the conversational aspects. So uh, the point here is that uh, this sequence of user utterances is fixed. And no matter what uh, the system would respond, the user would always ask these questions in this specific order, which is highly unrealistic. OK, so uh, we don't have a good way to evaluate it. And that's a bottleneck, because I believe that that's uh, one of the main reasons why people uh, work on component level tasks. Simply, there is no appropriate evaluation methodology for end-to-end -end evaluation. Can we use simulation to overcome this challenge? Um, the objective here is to simulate users in a way that uh, the behavior of simulated users would be indistinguishable from that of real humans. But importantly, we just want to do it in the context of a specific application and with respect to a specific evaluation measure. So this is, uh, you know, we don't want to simulate uh, user behavior, uh, because that's extremely difficult. What we want to simulate is uh, those traits of user behavior that are most important for system development and that would be captured in our evaluation measures. So formally, if we have some uh, system and user population and the measure, we want this user simulator used to be that uh, the relative ordering of two systems, S1 and S2, with respect to this evaluation measure M, would be the same using real users and simulated users. OK, so what would be the high level requirements for a simulator? Uh, I have identified five items, uh, but this is not an exhaustive list. And uh, you might uh, think of it as my wish list. And, uh, and uh, it's, a, it's, an, it's a highly ambitious uh, list. Uh, some, some of the items are quite challenging, but uh, uh, and not all uh, may be critical for initial simulator. Uh, to look at them quickly, uh, we would need to model personal interests and preferences and the persona of the person. Uh, interactions, which are not always text, but it can be speech, it can be clicking, it depends on the context. Users can learn and forget. And importantly, users also learn in practice how a system works, what its limitations are, and they try to work their way around that. And that's very important to, to consider in simulation. Uh, what happens often is that uh, 
with the new system, users try to push the boundaries of the system and see what it can and cannot do. And then later on, they will not try the things that uh, didn't work in the past. So this is a high level conceptual architecture of uh, this simulator. Uh, it has a user model component that represents all personal information related to user uh, knowledge preferences. There's an interaction model which captures the key actions and decisions and their flow that happen in a dialogue. There's a mental model which captures how a particular user thinks about a given system. And then there's a response generation component that uh, is responsible for determining how a simulated user should respond to a system utterance. It's modeled in three stages. In the planning stage, it figures out uh, what it wants to ask, the, the information need. Then in the execution stage, it decides on the course of execution based on the user's mental model of the system. For example, it will not attempt to navigate a list using voice if it didn't work in the past, but would rather click on the item. And then based on how the system reacts, this learner module can make updates to the user model and the mental model. And there is a natural language understanding and natural language generation which are very similar to the system side, and we can draw on research that has been done there, so I don't want to talk much about those. To operationalize that, there are at least uh, two things needed. Uh, these simulators would need to be seeded with actual data, so uh, based on, on real user behavior, and for that, there would need to be some, some data that is collected from, from real users. It could be uh, log data or it can be collected using crowdsourcing. And then simulators would need to be validated and that needs a, an actual operational platform where the, uh, we would compare simulated users against real users to make sure that the observations we are getting using the simulation align with the, uh, what is happening in real life. I want to mention that uh, I think this is a great uh, opportunity for academia and industry to collaborate. Uh, industry not share uh, data, uh, but they could validate simulators, for example, and, and see how well that aligns with the, uh, the behavior that they are observing from their users. It could also be that they could uh, seed simulators and uh, without sharing actual uh, private user data, they could uh, train a simulator on aggregate user data. Okay, the last thing uh, I want to mention is, at this point you might thinking, well, this sounds really nice, but can this actually work in practice? And uh, I want to uh, briefly mention a, a study uh, that we did with my former PhD student, uh, where we focused on the task of conversational item recommendation. And in particular, it was uh, in the movies domain. So we took three existing conversational movie recommender systems, which are labeled A, B, and C. And we compared them using both real and simulated users. Uh, for real users, we just paid users on a crowdsourcing platform to go and interact with these uh, agents until they get a recommendation that they like. And uh, it was a uh, a telegram based uh, uh, platform and for simulated users we based uh, their uh, we based them on on movie lens ratings so we seeded the uh, simulators with some of the ratings given by uh, some user and then evaluated against the rest of the ratings of that user so one experiment that we did was uh, how well do the relative system orderings correlate when we use real, real users versus simulated ones? So we have these uh, three systems, A, B, C. We have real users in the top row and then three different versions of the simulator, three increasingly most more advanced ones, and two evaluation measures, reward and success rate. And what we can see is that uh, with one exception, we get uh, uh, perfect correlation. Yes, it's only three uh, systems, uh, but also um, it's, 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 uh, it's um, uh, positive signal. 
uh, the other experiment we did was a, a kind of reverse Turing test where we wanted to use human judges to help us evaluate how realistic these uh, simulations are or the, the simulated dialogues. So the setup was the following. Each human assessor was given the transcripts of two conversations side by side in random order. One dialogue was done by a human user. Another one was done by a simulated user. And they had to guess which one was the real human. So in this experiment, our goal is to try to fool this human evaluator. So whenever they think that the simulated user was the human, that's a win for us. So we compared these three uh, simulators, again, from, from simple to more sophisticated. And in the last uh, case, we managed to fool humans in 36% of the cases and lost in 41% of cases, and there was a number of ties. So it's, it's uh, very promising. Uh, I don't want to claim too much here because the agent we used were rather simplistic. There's a, a limited action space, and it's easy to understand these agents because their responses uh, were template-based. But uh, I believe that these are nevertheless very promising results. There are many open questions uh, that remain, both uh, for conversation information access in general and uh, for simulation. I think uh, we do need uh, better measures for measuring conversation level uh, user satisfaction and uh, go beyond just relevance there. And in terms of simulation, it's still uh, a very much open question how robust this is what can be inferred uh, with confidence about the, the findings that we get uh, or measurements that we get using simulation and what are the limitations. So I want to close with uh, this slide. In the interest of time, I will stop and just let you read it. And uh, I'm happy to take questions. Any any question? No questions? Okay, let me start and then maybe maybe some of you will follow. Okay. Um, I I have a question about the mental model that you put in your in your schema there. Uh, you say that the mental model is useful to understand what is the um, uh, the perception uh, of the uh, of the user. Uh, yeah, of the conversational system. Um, how do we model instead, uh, I don't know, the different type of users? So for example, a professional user as opposed to a novice user, maybe a, a, a young child or, or maybe the, basically the mental state uh, or the uh, background knowledge uh, of a user. Is there a way in your model to model that? Yep, that's, that's, that's a great question. Uh, maybe there should be an arrow between the user model and the and the mental model um i'm not sure i have a ready answer to that but but, but uh, i i think it's uh, uh it would probably need some user studies with different types of users uh, to see and 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 use you know um uh, methodology from human computer interaction, like uh, uh, think aloud techniques to to develop this mental model. Understand? Yeah. In fact, I'm I'm assuming that the, the same information need, uh, let's say, in a I don't know, in a university professor and in a child will be expressed in a totally different conversation. Uh, that's why I'm, I'm thinking that perhaps that could be useful. But your your, your answer is is, is perfect. Any. Any other questions from the public? Okay. Uh, could you please come here because we don't find the microphone. Oh, okay, it's here. It's here. It's here. All right. <laughs> okay. It's the less valuable item in this room. So, <laughs> please. Hi, uh, hi, Christian. Thank you a lot for this work. I think it's very important. Um, 
I'm always wondering with the user simulation um, because we are simulating different users and of course then sometimes um, some systems work better for one users and uh, other systems are better for other users. What do you think? How many different users we would want to simulate? Like, is it a magnitude of the hundred or thousands or just ten? Um, that's that's a great question. Uh, so the way I I I don't know if it's if it's ten or or hundred, but but the um, so yeah, it's, yeah, I mean it's 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 a it's a I just want uh, to have a guess. Yep. Um, I mean, there is no reason to uh, not for a high number of users. Uh, um, I mean, this framework uh, or a simulator allows us to instantiate as many users as, as we can. And uh, uh, one might want to think about sampling there to make sure that, uh, you know, it's a representative sample and important user groups uh, are are captured uh, and the simulation by the way is also a way to make sure that uh, you know check if there are any biases against certain types of users so uh, generally i would try to be as exhaustive there as possible yeah okay thank you okay we have we have a couple of people uh online that have questions so uh, uh we cannot see oh yeah laura do you want to go for your question sure um thanks christian i i think you raised a really good point in how academia and industry can collaborate through um the simulation part that gets trained by industry and then the approach part that then academics can work on sort of like independently and this idea reminded me, and now I thought, okay, how about the next turn? You know, you have one simulator trained by industry, then the academic has a system, the system probably has an effect on the on the user behavior. Now the industry needs to train another simulator, so it goes back and forth and back and forth. And that actually reminded me of like a neural architecture on um, generative adversarial networks, GANs. And I'm wondering whether this is actually like a great sort of like theoretical foundation um, and kind of like further help like divide the two roles, just that we do a neural network training over multiple halves back and forth between industry and academia. Uh, I, I, I think that's a wonderful analogy. I, I, I didn't think about it that way, but, but uh, yeah, I, I guess that would be the point to, you know, try to have this, uh, uh, representation in the middle, the user simulator, which accurately captures what uh, both sides care about. So, um, yeah, um, it would be great to have a, a evaluation benchmark, for example, following this setup where there would be these multiple iterations between industry and academia trying to refine these uh, user uh, models and then uh, basically learning the parameters of that model on actual data. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, I think David also uh, online had a question. Uh, hopefully, a, ho hopefully a, a relatively simple question. I'm curious about what you see as the validation process for the uh, for the simulators to make sure they're working. How would one go about like making sure it seems good? Um, yeah. So, so basically, what we would want to make sure is that if we have, uh, um, you know, an algorithmic improvement according to some measure, according to the simulator, then we would observe the same improvement, at least relative improvement with the, with the real users. So every now and then uh, the evaluation or a comparison between two system variants done using simulation should also be done using real users using A-B testing or interleaving, depending on, on the type of the method. And then uh, 
you want to make sure that those two align. And and uh, you now A/B testing is expensive and and the bar is high, so uh, uh, one has to be conservative uh, with that. But uh, that would be the general idea. So, uh, or another way to think about it is uh, the way I think about it is simulation is a process in the pipeline. So you start with offline test collections. Uh, something works on the component level that you can see using simulation. If it works on uh, the end-to-end -end level, then you can, you know, A/B test it using uh, live users. If if you think the improvement is above that threshold, that would uh, warrant uh, deployment. And if the A/B test still agrees with the result, then it would go into production. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Um, we have another question from the public, uh, one man. Uh, hi, Christian. Ah. Hi, Christian, thank you. Uh, so I was wondering uh, where human in the loop fits here. Do you see it more like as a means of uh, training the simulator or as another means of evaluation? Uh, that's a great question. I think both. So uh, when you want to see the simulator, it depends on uh, you, you might not have enough uh, um, actual user data. It, it's a new feature that has never been uh, uh, exposed to any users. Uh, then you would need to get some users to collect uh, usage data. So that's the seeding stage. And then the validation, of course, uh, what we talked about earlier uh, in this uh, as, as part of A-B tests. Okay, I think for the sake of time, well, I don't see any questions anyway. So uh, thank you, Christian. Uh, uh, great talk. Let's thank you. Thank you.